So this is a application of commercial net for uh, segmentation of biological uh, tissue. And this was done by uh, Viren Jane and Sebastian Song and uh, a number of other people from Sebastian Song's lab at MIT. They're interested in reconstructing a uh, brain circuit from uh, uh, scanning electron microscope uh, images of uh, brain slices. So they, they, they take very thin slices of uh, brain tissue and then they have to identify the, the contours, essentially the membrane of the, of the neurons to be able to figure out the, the total collection of neurons in the, in the brain. In fact, here they only show a very, very small portion of the neurons because otherwise you wouldn't see anything. Um, and so they've used a, a convolutional net to do this. Basically, it's a 3D convolutional net that takes a, a small volume of, of voxels and then they train the, the system to, uh, to identify every voxel as being either a boundary or not a boundary. Um, and then they have some post-processing to figure out you know, the, where all the neurons are. And that's the result of, uh, of the algorithm. And they compare this with a bunch of other uh, methods and that seems to be what works best for them. So that's kind of a cool application uh, of conventional nets for segmentation. Um, let's see. So here's another one. Let me cut the sound here. This is a pedestrian detector. And um, it's been run here on this uh, video. Uh, I think it's a concert of some kind. And, and so here the commercial net has been trained on windows of images that are roughly 100 pixels uh, tall. And it's been trained to, uh, to, to turn on. It's got a single output, and it turns it on if there is a pedestrian, turns it off if there isn't. Um, and then it's applied to every sub-window in the image at every scale. And so whenever it fires, uh, it displays a, a, a rectangle with the corresponding size, and the uh, intensity of the rectangle depends on the score, if you want. Um, so it does a pretty good job with that. Uh, let's see. I think I have a better version of this, actually. This one. Here you go. That's what I want. So this is a, another version of the same system slightly better, slightly improved. So th this convolutional net actually is a little peculiar. It's got uh, connections that skip the, the layers. So it has, uh, it turns out to be useful to have uh, connections that are, um, to connect the classifier, the last layer, not just to the, the top stage, but also to feed uh, pool features from the, from the first stage uh, to the output that seems to improve the performance if you do that. And so this is a pedestrian detector system based on this, uh, this idea has got quite a few uh, false positives here. The threshold is set pretty low. Uh, what else do I want to show you? This. So this is another uh, application of commercial nets. This is for robot vision. Uh, for driving robots around. And so here's a robot that has, um, it's a mobile robot about this tall, weighs about 100 kilos. It's got uh, four cameras, two stereo pairs. And that's the, pretty much the only sensor or distance sensor it has, um, the, the cameras. It has GPS, it has a inertial uh, navigation unit. It's got uh, sensors in the wheel that count how many times the wheels turn. And so here we use a traditional vision system based on stereo vision, basically that figures out if something sticks out of the ground or not. And if something sticks out of the ground, it, it tries to avoid it. The problem with stereo vision is that you can only see uh, objects or the 3D structure of objects up to about 10 meters or so. If they're further than 10 meters, you can't really tell at what distance they are. And that means you, you don't know if there are obstacles you should avoid or not. Um, so this, this sequence you just saw was with uh, the pure, and this one also is purely with the stereo system. Uh, here we actually crippled it to some extent. And here we turned on the convolutional net, which 
uh, only looks at um, it's not stereo, so it looks only at one uh, or, or you know two cameras, but they're not pairs. And here from the start, it figures out there is this row of people, and it uh, f you know knows that it has to avoid them. <laughs> So this guy here has a radio transmitter in his hand, but it's not, you know, he's not actually controlling the robot. <laughs> uh, ooh, having a hard time. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, no, he's, he's, he's just holding the penny, penny button. <laughs> um, So, so the, the commercial net in this case here looks at uh, bands of images that are kind of centered on the horizon. So we know roughly the orientation of the horizon from the, from the ground plane. And uh, they're fed to the commercial net. And then it's trained to distinguish uh, things that are traversable from things that are non-traversable from things that are right at the border of between things that are traversable and not. So these... Uh, this is a result of stereo vision, and as you can see, the labels stop after 10 meters or so. Uh, so we can't see very far. Whereas these are the result of applying this convolutional net, and it sees very far away, so you can tell us there's a path here that you can, you can take, and here you have to go around this building. Um, so it's not subject to uh, the same limitation. And, um, and the cool thing about this, this guy is that we, we pre-train it su in supervised mode in the lab, but then we, uh, we, uh, we let it refine itself as the robot runs. So we use the labels produced by the stereo vision system to train the convolutional net on the fly as the robot uh, runs. In fact, it only trains the last layer, so the, the n minus 1 first layers are fixed. They've been trained beforehand. Uh, but the last layer is being refined as the robot uh, runs, and so it adapts to the environment. So, so you get this, um, you know, labeling of the, of the scene. You know, it's very much like the, the, the scene labeling system I was showing you earlier, except that uh, there's only th essentially three categories here, traversable, non-traversable, and, you know, whatever is in between. And then, uh, then you can put this in a map, and then you can do the, some planning in that map. And uh, skip ahead a little bit. Um, and so you, you can write those, those pixel maps into the map. There is also a very fast uh, stereo vision system that's designed to avoid nearby obstacles that are unexpected. Um, so that goes into this map in which you can do the planning and uh, drive, drive the robot so as to avoid obstacles and get, get to the goal as, uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah? So it comes from a combination. It comes from two things. It comes from the uh, the baseline between the two cameras in the stereo pair, and from the resolution of the camera. Yes. So if you have a uh, you know 1,024 pixels on a row and you have a 10 centimeter baseline, basically, if you calibrate your camera really carefully, you can go up to 20, 25 meters. But um, but with sort of more pedestrian calibration, it's more like 10, 15 meters, and it gets really inaccurate, inaccurate beyond that. So we need a, a wide baseline and higher resolution, but then it costs you a nominal lag in computation. Uh, there's some learning taking place in the trajectory uh, control here, which I'm not going to talk about, but uh, just, so, just because the, I'm just going to show the video because they're fun, but um, not, uh, no particular. There's, uh, there's some learning there, but it's very, very much sort of memory based learning. So here is the robot running around. So here we crippled the vision system. We turned off the the convolutional net, we only turned on the, long, the short range uh, stereo, which sees uh, up to about two and a half meters. And so it's pretty much driving in a fog. This is accelerated twice, by the way. Uh, this is Pierre Samanet, who is fairly confident in the code that he wrote. And this is Raya Hetzel, also fairly confident. <laughs> 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 okay, that's all for the videos. 
All right, so let me talk about unsupervised running now, because this, this is really the, the topic of, of the day or of the week, <laughs> or of the three weeks. Um, OK, so th there's, there's one sort of fundamental problem with this whole uh, supervised running approach, which is that the networks that you would like to use that are big enough to solve the problem you want, uh, just have, they just have too many parameters. Or generally, unless you are Google, you don't have enough training samples to train them. Uh, and again, I want to repeat, unless you're Google. If you're Google, you're OK. Uh, but if you're not Google, uh, you probably don't have enough uh, labeled samples to train, to train your network um, for the size it has. So there's an, uh, an idea which consists in pre-training the network in an unsupervised manner, um, and then to refine it using uh, supervised learning. But then you start from a good starting point because it's been pre-trained using unsupervised learning. Um, so I want to say a few words about uh, what I think unsupervised learning is all about. Okay, And this view may be very different from what you will read in other places. Um, and so I think, um, OK, this is useless. So unsupervised learning is about capturing uh, dependencies between input variables. right? So if you have uh, a bunch of input variables and you can predict a subset of those input variables from the values of, of the rest, that means there are dependencies between them. Even if the prediction is not exact, even if it's a probabilistic prediction, that means there are dependencies between them. And unsupervised learning consists in capturing those dependencies. Okay? Uh, in fact, in the most abstract form, you could think of unsupervised learning as the goal of uh, learning a contrast function or an energy function here in the space of y. So here I only have one input variable, which is kind of lame. I should draw a two-dimensional version of this. Um, and it consists in having, you know, coming up with some sort of contrast function. And this contrast function will take low values in areas where you have lots of data. And it will take higher values in areas where you don't have as much data. OK? So let's imagine, for example, that we, so going back to the example I was showing you earlier with the convolutional net, where you have a number three that's being distorted in all possible ways, uh, this will kind of form some sort of manifold in the space of all possible pixels, right? And if you had a little box that told you uh, you are on the manifold, you are not on the manifold of three, then you have a three classifier, right? You have a machine that can tell you whether a point is on the manifold of the three or not, then you have a, classif a classifier for, for a detector, at least, for the category three. Um, or if you have a machine that just tells you this looks very much like a digit, I don't know what type, but it's a digit, uh, this, th there must be something useful you can do with that. Uh, so if you, um, in a weak form, the only thing you need is, a, is this contrast function, low value on the manifold or on data, high value everywhere else. If you're a probabilist, you want this function to be uh, the log of a probability distribution uh, or probability, probability density function. Um, so something like this, for example. So here there is an obvious dependency between the two variables, uh, x and y. Basically, y is equal to x squared. Okay? And this uh, contrast function here tells you uh, whether, um, um, you know, whether y is equal to x squared. It's going to take minimal values whenever y is equal to x squared, and it's going to take higher values uh, outside of that. And those two contrast functions are equally good. Okay, they both tell you whether you are on this, uh, on this curve or not. Uh, here I'm sort of depicting uh, different types of learning algorithms that may learn those uh, energy surfaces uh, with different loss function. So you could think of a simple way of learning a, of, of, uh, of training a machine to produce an energy function this way. So imagine you have a parameterized box, okay, a function that takes uh, your, your input uh, vector as, as input, and then produces a single scalar, which is this, the value of this energy. And you're going to train this function. You're going to parameterize this function. You're going to train it so that it takes low values on the point that you feed it, and it, and it takes higher values everywhere else. OK? And I'm sure Jeff told you about RBMs this morning. Do you uh, talk about RBMs? Uh, why am I even asking this question? Um, so. The, the, the basic idea of RBMs for training RBMs is very much like is very much based on this idea. You uh, you have an energy function represented by the RBM, and you show a, a data uh, a data point to the RBM, and you 
uh, change the parameters so that the energy of the RBM is diminished on that point. And then you move away from that point a little bit um, using the sort of sampling up-down algorithm. And, um, and then you take that new point, which hopefully is away from the manifold of data, and you push it up. Okay? You change the parameters so that the energy of that point goes up. That's the basic idea of contrasted divergence. Um, and so uh, some of the algorithms I'm showing he, uh, here actually are based on this idea as well. They, they kind of push down on the data and they push up on things that are nearby. Uh, but of course here it's trivial because it's very low dimensional. Um, so you can always go from energy to probability and vice versa with you know, a few minor assumptions uh, through what's called the Gibbs distribution, which I'm sure so Jeff talked about. Um, uh, in such a way that you can uh, say that the density um, of, uh, that your model gives to, uh, to the uh, input space um, is equal to this uh, uh, gives Boltzmann distribution exponential minus beta, where beta is a kind of arbitrary positive parameter, uh, times the energy function for that particular point, and then you normalize this whole thing by the sum of, of this uh, numerator over all possible y, so that you get a uh, density uh, function that uh, integrates to one. Or if you take the integral of this with respect to y, you get the same stuff above and below, and that's equal to one. Uh, but in fact, you know, you don't actually need this distribution. You you might just you might just want to uh, stick to this energy function and just manipulate that. Okay. So if you stick to this energy function and just manipulate that, that's called uh, energy-based models. In fact, um, it doesn't matter whether you interpret this as a probability or not. Um, but the basic idea of having a contrast function like this, that you train to be uh, low on the points, high everywhere else, that's energy-based models. So what can you use energy-based models for? You can use them uh, to represent images that I'll show you in a minute, but you can use them also for uh, things like, say, restoration, image denoising, or in-painting, right? So imagine you have a high-dimensional function in the space of all possible uh, images, the space of pixels, and it tells you, it gives you a low number if the image looks nice, it gives you a high number if the image looks noisy. Okay? Imagine I give you this function. You can use this function to denoise, right? Because if you have a noisy image, you plug it into the box, and then the box tells you that's noisy. Then you can do some sort of gradient descent to figure out what is the image that's, that is close, as close as possible to the original noisy image that I gave, but at the same time has low energy. And that way you will denoise the image. In fact, there is a lot of denoising algorithms that are, basic, that are based on this idea. Okay? Uh, and the energy is uh, essentially a sparse coding uh, uh, function. The problem, of course, is how do you come up with that box? How do you train a high dimensional energy function to give you low energy at the right place and, and not at the wrong place? So if you're a probabilist, uh, or if you like uh, things that are sort of properly, uh, uh, proper probability distributions, um, you can use maximum likelihood. So you could say, um, I have a point here, I have a data point, and what I want is, I want to, uh, a, um, so let's say I have a bunch of data points. Uh, I'm going to come up with a loss function, and the loss function is going to be, um, well, I'm going to use maximum likelihood. So I'm going to try to maximize the probability that my model gives to every data point, okay? The product of all data points or the probability that my model gives to the data point. And the probability that the model gives to a data point is this Gibbs distribution here, the ratio of e to the minus beta, the energy, divided by the uh, partition function, the so-called partition function. That, that, that's a term that comes from physics, which is the integral over, uh, over all possible y's of, of the numerator to uh, normalize. OK, so if I want to uh, maximize the product of this over all samples, um, it would be equivalent to minimizing the minus log of this uh, over, over a single sample and then summing that up over samples, okay? I'm just gonna do this over a single sample. So I'm gonna minimize minus log of this probability. I'm gonna to try to find a W that minimizes minus log of the probability of the data points summed over all data points, or so average over all data points. And I'm writing the loss function here for a single data point, okay? So the loss function for a particular Y, a particular value of the parameters, is the energy that my model gives to this particular y for this particular value of the parameter. And you want to make that small, okay? You're going to minimize this loss function, so it's going to make this term small. And it's going to make this, this other term small, that other term is just minus log of this, right? It's actually one over beta minus log of that. Um, so 
you know, this whole thing here is just minus log of that divided by beta, nothing more. Um, so this is minus log of the partition function divided by beta. And so you want to make this whole thing small. And to make this whole thing small, you have to make all those energies as large as possible because it's in the negative exponential here. So if you want to make the negative exponential small, you have to make the energies big. OK? So basically, to minimize this, what you have to do is push down on the energy of the sample and push up on the energies of everything else. All right? Push down on the energy of the sample, push up on the energies of everything else through by changing the parameter vector, obviously, right? That's the only thing you can do. You can tweak the parameter vector. OK, so let's see how we do this with, with compute the gradient. So we have the last function. We compute the derivative of it, the gradient of it with respect to the, to the parameters. So the first term is the, the gradient of the energy at the data point with respect to the parameters. Presumably, we know how to compute this because we built the energy function. And then the second term uh, turns into something funny. If you've never seen this before, it looks funny, but trust me, it's true. Um, the derivative of, of this complicated thing here turns out to be this fairly simple thing here. It's the integral over all possible y of the probability that the model gives to this y, where this probability is given by the Gibbs distribution, multiplied by the gradient of the energy for this particular y with respect to the parameters. Okay? So this is kind of like a weighted sum. This is like an expectation of a gradient. Uh, where the expectation is taken over the, uh, the probability uh, that the model gives to every point on the space, in the space, OK? So what that tells you is that the force with which uh, the energy of a point is going to be pushed up, OK? See, you have a minus sign here. So the force with which the energy of a particular point y is going to be pushed up is proportional to the probability that the model gives to this particular point, OK? So the lower the energy, the higher the probability of a point, the lower its energy, and the, the stronger the force with which it's going to be pushed up, right? So if, if I have a data point here, it's going to be pushed down with a unit force, if you want. And all the other points are going to be pushed up with forces that are all smaller than 1. Their integral is 1. Uh, but the force is going to be larger for, for points that have lower energy than for points that have higher energy. Those are not going to be pushed up much. OK, so that all makes sense, right? Now, of course, unfortunately, this integral is impossible to compute. But fortunately, this is an expectation. You can, you can approximate this using Monte Carlo methods or Markov chain Monte Carlo methods or you know, hybrid Monte Carlo methods, whatever you want. Uh, and so you know, basically, what, what, it consists, what this will consist in doing would be to uh, you take a data sample, compute the gradient of the energy at that data sample with respect to the parameter, and change the parameters in the negative direction of that, and then take one sample y taken from that distribution from the model, OK? Assuming you can do this. And then uh, update the parameters uh, in the positive direction of the gradient now to pull the energy of that point up, OK? And the trick is, how do you pick this point that you're going to push up the energy of, OK? So um, um, uh, contrasted divergence um, that was explained this morning, I suppose, um, consist in picking this point by starting from y and then moving away from y, preferably in the, with some noise, preferably in the direction where energies go down, but not necessarily with a bit of, of a kick or a, you know, a bit of noise. And then you, you end up on a point that's nearby and you push up the energy of that guy. So it's not a necessarily a good approximation of this uh, probability distribution. Uh, but what it does is that it creates a local groove in the energy surface around the, the data sample. And that's really all you care about. You don't care about the behavior about the energy function of the energy function far away from the samples. You care that near the samples it, it takes the right shape. Um, so, right, so it turns out there are several solutions to this problem of pushing up the energy of everything else. So the first one I just explained is contrasted divergence. Move away from a training sample a bit and push, on, push up on that. Uh, another solution that came out of Apoi Varinen's uh, work is called score matching. And score matching is, um, is a very cute idea, but it's very difficult to implement in practice. Um, it consists in um, when you are at a particular point, you make sure the gradient of the energy with respect to the input, not with respect to the parameters, is as small as possible. So you minimize the square of the gradient of your scoring function, energy function, with respect to the input. And that will guarantee that the point is at a local optimum or local minimum, presumably. 
of the energy function. And simultaneously, you maximize the uh, trace of the Hessian of that energy function with respect to the input so that it curls up. Okay? Um, so it's very cute, and um, it's uh, equivalent with some, in some respect to maximum likelihood. The problem is you have to compute the gradient with respect to the parameters of the trace of the Hessian of the energy function with respect to the input. And you know, if you have a simple linear model with just a simple nonlinearity on top, it's okay. But if you have a multilayer model, forget it. Um, unless you have some sort of automatic differentiation engine. Um, there are other solutions called denoising or contracting autoencoders, which are not energy-based. I'm not going to talk about this because Joshua Bengio will talk about this at length when he, whenever he speaks. So I'm just going to skip over that. But there's a, th a fourth solution which I'm, I'm going to talk about, which is to uh, use a regularizer or sparsity constraint on an internal code in the, in the machine. Okay, and this uh, idea that goes back to 2007, uh, AI Stats paper, uh, first author is Marco Lorenzato. You'll, you'll hear him speak also in the third week. Um, so let me go into that a little bit. Okay, so first of all, before I go into that, um, let me tell you about the connection. So the, 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 the favorite model that uh, many of us use is uh, for, for unsupervised learning is a model called uh, encoder decoder, or that I call encoder decoder. Basically, you have two variables. Y, you can think of as the input, and Z, you can think of as kind of a representation of Y, maybe a feature vector that represents Y, okay? It's really a latent variable, okay? So this, uh, this variable, you know, goes into two modules, but it's not produced by any of them, so it's, it's kind of like a, a latent variable, if you want. Think of this as a, a graphical model, a factor graph, where those two uh, red squares are factors. Uh, those blue functions here are deterministic functions going one way. And those are uh, variable nodes. Um, and the, uh, the sort of encoder-decoder architecture, or autoencoder, is, is one where you take the input variable, you run it through an encoder. Uh, you take the uh, latent variable, you run it through a decoder. And then you compare the decoded version uh, the, the sort of result of the decoding with the input, and you compare the result of the encoding with the latent variable. And uh, you want to find, if you know what y is, you want to find the z that minimizes the sum of those two factors. Okay, you have some sort of energy function that uh, um, determines how to compute z for a given y. Okay, so now our energy function is, uh, has two arguments, y and z. Of course, there's a third argument, which are the parameters of those two functions, which I'm not writing. And it's the sum of two terms, the distance between y and the decoding function of z, and the distance between z and the encoding function of y. Now, if you identify uh, the encoding function as minus wy, and the distance uh, simply as uh, the dot product between z transpose between z and wy, and similarly, the decoder would be w transpose z, where, where w is the same matrix as we have here, and the distance, again, is dot product. Um, then you get that the energy function is the sum of those two terms. And this term and that term are actually equal. It's equal to that. That's uh, the energy function of a restricted Boson machine. Okay, so a restricted Boson machine, which you heard about this morning, is uh, an encoder-decoder system of a particular kind with a particular distance function equal to dot product or minus dot product, and where the encoder and decoding function are simply multiplication by a matrix, but where the variables are constrained, are constrained to be binary. Of course, there's non-binary versions of RBMs, but here I'm just talking about that. Uh, the real energy function, of course, does not depend on Z, so you have to marginalize over Z to really have the, the real free energy function of that uh, system, which you can write this way, but let me skip over this for now. Um, OK, so we're going to use this little encoder-decoder architecture, but not necessarily with these particular encoders and decoders. Uh, but we're going to use it as a way of representing data, OK? And, um, and I should mention that there are various unsupervised learning algorithms, some of which are decoder-only and some of which are encoder-only, uh, and some of which have both encoder and decoder. Um, and some of the most popular ones actually only have a decoder, as, as you'll see in a, in a minute. OK, so here's the basic idea. The basic idea is um, we're going we're gonna to put a constraint on this code in such a way that it can only take a, very, a, a relatively small number of possible configurations. Or in other words, we're going to put a penalty function on it so that it cannot take too many uh, possible configurations without paying for it. Okay. 
And as a side effect, this is, this is going to have an interesting side effect of making the energy of most points that we're not training the system on high. Okay? So it has the same effect as kind of pushing up explicitly on the energy of points we don't want. And the reason for this is a little complicated, but, uh, but let me take you through it. Okay, so let's imagine we have an input space, and these are kind of configuration, possible configurations in the input space. And our feature space, the space of the Z, has you know, precisely the same number of configurations, in this case discrete. Okay? So we can have an encoding function that goes from input to feature, and then reconstructs from feature to input. And or encoder, you know, encoder decoder doesn't do anything interesting because it's basically just a, an identity function, right? It encodes and it reconstructs. And so what that means is that every point here is going to be exactly reconstructed if the encoder and the decoder are, are kind of, uh, the composition of them is the identity function, then our system is not interesting because every point is properly, is exactly reconstructed, which means every point has energy zero because the energy is the sum of the uh, reconstruction error and the prediction error, okay? So in an encoder-decoder architecture, uh, one term in the energy is this reconstruction error, which is the distance between the input and the reconstruction, okay? And we could have this other term, which we're going to assume is zero for now. Uh, so here, every point has zero reconstruction error. It's not a very interesting um, uh, contrast function, as I was telling before, because we want the contrast function to take low values on points we're interested in and high values everywhere else. So imagine our training samples are only those three samples, okay? And these guys are undesirable. So we want the, the uh, energy function to be low on these guys and high on these guys, okay? Um, so this is, you know, not going to work unless we restrict the number of possible configuration in the feature space to be small. In this case here, it's a conspiracy. I set the number of possible configurations to be equal to the number I actually need. Okay, and so, um, so now the encoding function has no choice. It has to map any of those points, all of those points, to one of those three points. That's the only thing it can do. Okay, so the encoding function goes here for this point, and then this guy gets properly reconstructed. But if you take another point, it has to go to one of those three points. So let's say it picks the same point here. Now this guy is going to get reconstructed by this, which means uh, you're going to have a non-zero reconstruction error, which means the energy of that point is going to be high, okay? Because the energy includes the reconstruction error as a, as a term. So by simply re restricting the number of possible configurations in feature space, I've managed to uh, constrain the volume of points in inputs that can take low energy, okay? So I've automatically made the energy of points that I'm that are outside of the ones that are low, high, okay? The volume of the ones that are slow is, is necessarily small. Can be bigger than that. Um, so we can do this, we can do this restriction on the information content of the code in various ways. And <coughs> um, actually, let me skip ahead a little bit so that I give you some more explicit examples of that. Oh, here we go. Okay, so let's say, um, let's say our, our training samples come from this spiral here in two dimension, okay? So we have an uh, uh, encoder system, an unsupervised learning system with two inputs, um, x1 and x2, or y1 and y2, I should say. Uh, our training samples are along this spiral. There are a bunch of points along this spiral. And I'm going to train the function to uh, minimize the uh, an energy function to minimize the uh, expected energy, energy of all those points. So I'm going to use uh, PCA here. So what is PCA? PCA is a linear encoder with the W matrix and a linear decoder where the decoding matrix is the transpose of the first one. And I have an energy function like this, which is the, you know, the, the square difference, the square distance between the input and the input once it's encoded and decoded by the W matrix, okay? So it's a very simple energy function. Now, the reason PCA works is that the code here, which is the product of W by Y, has lower dimension than Y. And because it has lower dimension than Y, that means the dimension of the space of objects that can be perfectly reconstructed is small. 
Okay? The principal uh, uh, subspace is a subspace of things that are exactly reconstructed as, as themselves. Anything that's outside of that principal subspace is going to be reconstructed as its projection on the, on the subspace, on the linear subspace. Therefore, its reconstruction error is its distance, square distance, to the subspace. Okay? So the best that PCA can do, so here I've, what, I've, what I'm plotting here is the grayscale corresponds to the value of this energy function after I've trained the W matrix to do the best possible job on the data set. And what it finds is that, uh, you know, this is the principal axis of those samples, uh, this, this black line here. And the energy function is zero along this line and is, increases quadratically as you move away from this line, right? So PCA uh, restricts the volume of stuff that can take low energy just because the dimension of the code is small. But we've said before that having a low dimensional code is not a good idea if you want, if you want to use it for classification. So PCA actually as a feature extraction mechanism really sucks. You don't want to use it for anything. Okay, k-means, that's the second most popular, maybe the most popular unsupervised learning algorithm. Um, you know, in uh, WE it's called uh, vector quantization, but it's the same thing. So here, the energy function is something funny. Uh, you have an energy which, is, which depends on y and z, which is the code, and uh, and it's equal to the sum of a prototype of zi, which is a binary variable, times the square distance between the input and the ith prototype squared. And zi is a binary variable that can take, uh, uh, well, z is a, is a binary vector, and it's constrained to take uh, values of the type 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so it's a one of n code. Only one component is allowed to be one. All the other ones are, are required to be zero. And if you uh, enforce this constraint on z, then the energy function for, for uh, k-means uh, is just that. And the way you find z is by minimizing this energy function with respect to z. So if I give you a y, you find a z that minimizes this energy function, and you get the, uh, you get the uh, zi equal to 1 for the y that is closest to its own prototype, and then all the other ones are 0. That's the best way to minimize this energy function, right? So you can think of zi as an indicator function for which prototype is closer to the, the current sample. OK, so if you train the prototype with the k-means clustering algorithm uh, on this uh, spiral data, what you get is that you know, each of the prototype essentially sort of spaced themselves equally along the, the curve. And around each of those prototypes, there is a, a little uh, parabola, if you want. Okay. And the bottom of this parabola is kind of, are kind of the dark areas. And, um, and you know, the, the min of all those parabolas is what, is, is what constitutes this uh, energy function. So now here, the energy function is forced to be non-zero outside of the manifold of samples just because it's a collection, it's a discrete collection of small parabolas. And there's only a, a finite number of them. So if you put them around the data points, that means the energy function, the energy is going to be higher outside of the of the manifold of samples, OK? So that's an explanation of kind of an unsupervised learning algorithm in terms of minimizing this kind of, you know, in terms of shaping a, co a contrast function that takes low value on the manifold of samples and high values everywhere else. OK, so with this example, it looks like k-means is the best algorithm ever, but it's not true because it doesn't scale very much, very, very well with high, in high dimension. You know, in high dimension, it's very, high, it's very difficult to fill up the space with you know, prototypes everywhere. Right, so I talked about PCA. So here, here's another example here, another data set where we have points along lines, okay? And we'd like to find uh, a contrast function that tells us if, you, if we are along those points. So PCA just croaks, essentially, it just finds this axis but ignores that. Um, and, you know, k-means finds three, uh, you know, point, puts the prototype kind of on the, you know, on those branches. There's something called sparse coding, which is kind of interesting. So sparse coding is this little energy function here. So let me actually skip ahead to tell you, tell you more about this. Okay, so this is sparse coding. So this is a very popular algorithm. It came out of uh, work by, uh, so sparse coding actually has its root in applied math. Um, by uh, Stéphane Mala and 
uh, David Donohoe and people, people like that, statistics and math, applied math. Um, and it's the idea of representing an input vector as a sparse linear combination of columns of a so-called dictionary matrix WD. Okay, so you have a matrix here WD whose columns are called atoms or basis functions. And then you have a vector Z and you're going to compute a Z vector with lots of zero components in it in such a way that Y is uh, reconstructed as well as possible by this uh, sparse vector. And the way you're going to enforce that this vector is sparse is by minimizing the L1 norm of that vector. So some constant multiplied by the sum over components of the absolute value of the component. Okay? So it's L2 norm of the, of the reconstruction error, L1 norm of the uh, code. So in terms of kind of uh, factor graph or graphical model, you can think of it this way. You have uh, input variable y, you have the code variable z, and the code variable z is uh, multiplied by this WD matrix, and uh, then you compute the square distance between the y and this reconstruction, and then there's another factor, which is where you take the absolute values of all the components of z, and then you sum them up, and that's the second factor. Okay, so there's an inference algorithm that consists in, uh, for a given y, of computing the z that minimizes this energy. Okay, so this is... Uh, this little expression here. So the z hat, if you want, is the optimal z corresponding to a particular y, and it's the whatever value of z minimizes this energy, okay? And it's gonna be a sparse vector, most likely. Um, so that's sparse coding. Sparse modeling is, uh, is, is the question of how you train such a system, how you train the dictionary matrix so that the reconstructions are as, as good as possible and the vectors are as sparse as possible for, on a particular data set, okay? You can do this with gradient descent, it's very simple. Um, so I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk later about how you do this inference, by the way. So, um, so what you do is you, um, <clears throat> you, um, you plug a Y, you find the uh, corresponding optimal Z for the current value of WD, okay? And that's gonna give you some particular uh, reconstruction error here. You compute the gradient of this reconstruction error with respect to WD. And it's very simple to do because the reconstruction error is a quadratic function of WD. Okay, so compute the gradient of this reconstruction, reconstruction error with respect to WD, and then update WD in the negative direction of that gradient. Okay, and then go to the next sample and do the same. And you keep doing this. Uh, so this, you can think of this as a stochastic gradient descent algorithm to minimize the average energy uh, uh, the average you know, energy after minimization with respect to Z with respect to W. Now if you do it the way I just said, there's one missing ingredient, it's not actually going to work. The reason it's not going to work is, be is because the system is very happy to make WD very, very large so as to be able to make Z very, very small. And there's an indeterminacy there, right? You can multiply WD by 100 and divide Z by 100 and you'll get the same reconstruction error but you, you, you'll, you'll win on that term. So that's exactly what this algorithm will do. So to prevent, it, to prevent it from doing it, what you do is you normalize the columns of WD so that they all have norm one or less than one. So you, constrained, you constrain the uh, norm of the columns of WD to be less than one. And that prevents things from blowing up. Um, so again, uh, let me repeat uh, once more this algorithm. Plug a Y, find a Z that minimizes the sum of those two terms, um, and then compute the gradient for this particular z, compute the gradient of this quadratic term with respect to WD, update WD so as to make that smaller. That's a step of stochastic gradient. <coughs> then renormalize the columns of WD that are smaller than one, so that now they are one, uh, that are bigger than one, I'm sorry, so that they are now one. And then go to the next sample and do the same. And that's a stochastic, you can think of this as a stochastic gradient learning algorithm. So this is the uh, so-called sparse modeling algorithm by Osas and Field, uh, who are two neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists uh, from 1997. Uh, they used a, a different regularizer, but it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so that's a really cool uh, little uh, algorithm. And you can think of this as kind of a decoder-only uh, kind of algorithm, as I was telling you about uh, before. Um, uh, 
OK, so one idea with uh, putting a, an encoder in the system is, um, OK, so first of all, let me just talk about uh, sparse coding for, for a minute. OK, so now once, once you have this, uh, once you've trained the sparse coding algorithm, if I give you a Y, you have to minimize this function to get the appropriate Z. There's lots of efficient algorithms to do this. In fact, some of the most efficient ones uh, were invented by Stan Osher, who is here at UCLA, and you'll hear, hear from him in the third week, I believe. Um, it's called coordinate descent. Uh, there's an algorithm called FISTA, fast iterative and sh uh, shrinkage and thresholding algorithm. There's all kinds of algorithms to make, to, uh, uh, make this minimization with respect to Z uh, fast. Uh, and then most of, most of them come from the sort of applied ma um, math uh, community. Um, but it's still quite slow. So for example, if Y is a, an image patch or a, a low level feature vector, let's say SIF vectors or vectors coming out of the first layer of a convolutional net, you know, it could, there could be several, uh, there could be a couple hundred components here. And this could be a thousand components. And, and you have to do this for every region in the image. That might actually be quite expensive. Um, So, um, okay, before I go too far, so here's an example uh, of what sparse coding gives you if you train. So these are the columns of the WD matrix where the uh, input vectors are digits taken from the MNIST data set. And, and the columns of the WD matrix, each column has the same size as an image from MNIST. So I can, I can represent it as an image. And so here I represented all of them. And what you can see is that uh, those, those basis functions, the columns of WD, are kind of small segments. There's the small strokes of ink, if you want. And it kind of makes sense because uh, what that means, what sparse coding, what sparse coding uh, means is that you can reconstruct pretty much any digit as a sparse linear combination of a small number, I mean, as a linear combination of a small number of these guys. And if you want the linear combination to have a small number of terms, the best thing is to come up with parts that you, know, you can combine in lots of different ways, right? And so the algorithm kind of spontaneously discovers that. Um, so you, know, you can build a, a nine as, out of the, this tail and then add a, you know, a circle on top and then maybe another, things like that. Um, if you train it on natural image patches, you'll get what's called Gabor filters, so oriented edge detectors. Okay, so this is the learning algorithm running from a, starting from a random initial condition and converging towards those Gabor filters. You, know, you get something like this. In fact, the results I'm showing you here are not the results of sparse coding, they're the results of a slightly different algorithm called predictive sparse decomposition, which I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. Um, but the results are essentially identical. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so here is the idea of predictive sparse decomposition. That's where I'm going to, to end. Um, so we have this uh, decoder sparse coding algorithm. What we're gonna do is, and, and again, the uh, inference of finding an optimal Z uh, for a given y, because you know, requires minimizing the sum of those two factors, and that's expensive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build an encoder function, which we're going to train to predict for any given y what the optimal z should be. Okay, or or not what it should be, but but predict um, as close as possible the value of the optimal z. Okay, so we plug a y, we compute the optimal z according to sparse coding. And then we use this pair Y and optimal Z as a, as a supervised training pair to train this feedforward encoder system uh, so, so that it predicts Z. Okay, and we're gonna design this function so that it's simple to compute and so that it has a, a chance of actually approximating the optimal Z. So this general idea of uh, where you have sort of a inference algorithm that's complicated that requires an optimization that might be expensive and that you train a feedforward model with a finite um, known affordable complexity to predict the result of this complicated optimization on your training set. It's a very general idea. Um, 
And uh, it's, it's, it looks like a free lunch at first. It looks like you know, it can't possibly work. You know, how is it that you, can, you could possibly approximate with a simple feedforward function the result of some complex optimization algorithm? But the point is you're not trying to approximate this, this result of, of the optimization on the entire uh, set of inputs. You're only trying to approximate it on the samples that you are interested in, which in the case of uh, what I've just shown are natural image patches or handwritten digits, okay? On anything else, on random combinations of pixels, you don't care what the optimal Z is. You're never gonna use it for that. So there, of course, the system will not give you the right answer. Uh, so that's where the trade-off is. You're trading off, uh, you know, you, you're, you get, you're gaining a lot in efficiency for the points you're interested in, but what you lose is the uh, ability to compute a solution for any point. So the application of this idea to sparse coding is called predictive sparse decomposition, or the PSD. Um, and uh, I'm happy to report that this paper was rejected from about three conferences, so we kind of gave up on publishing it. It's just an archive. But it's the thing that we use all the time and that a lot of people use, so why publish it anywhere else? Um, so here, uh, we basically integrate this encoder and decoder thing into a single system, so that's a bit more like, a, like an RBM like I was showing earlier, except we have this sparsity regularization term. Okay, so the first term here is a reconstruction error that we are familiar with, uh, input minus uh, feature vector multiplied by decoding matrix. And then the other term is this term, is, you can call this a prediction error, is the feature vector minus some nonlinear function applied to uh, a parameterized nonlinear function of the input vector, uh, y. Okay, so it's g, G encoder of W encoder and YI. And the simplest uh, thing you can use for this is very simple, it's something like this, where you take Y, you multiply it by a matrix, WE. This matrix will have the same dimension as the transpose of WD, of course. And then you, uh, you hit this with a so-called shrinkage function component by component. What the shrinkage function does is this. It's this black function here. It, uh, it takes every value and it, it shrinks it towards zero. And, if, and you don't allow it to cross zero. So if it hits zero, it just stays at zero, okay? So it's just a piecewise linear function. In fact, we use kind of a smooth version of it so, th so that it's differentiable and we, we don't uh, have problems training this with gradient descent. So the algorithm is as follows. Uh, you take a Y, you find a Z that minimizes this, okay? So the Z that minimizes this is gonna be a Z vector that reconstructs the input, but also is not too far away from whatever this guy predicts and at the same time is sparse. Okay, and then once you have that z, you uh, compute the gradient of this term with respect to wd and make a step and normalize it. And then you compute the gradient of this whole term with respect to we and make a step. And there you don't need to normalize. And so in fact, the re those results are, the, are uh, the result of this PSD algorithm. But again, they're, really, they're the same as sparse coding really. You get pretty much the same result qualitatively at least. Okay, so what that allows you to do is that uh, it allows you to um, now train one of those little autoencoders. I should go back to this. So it allows you to train one of those little autoencoders to uh, turn a Y vector into a possibly higher dimensional Z vector that happens to be sparse. And the mapping to go from Y to Z is nonlinear which means that uh, this representation of Y is, is probably gonna be useful for classification. Okay, so one thing that's good is that you know that Z contains as much information as possible as, uh, uh, about Y uh, because you know, presumably it's been trained to be able to reconstruct Y from Z. So there's no information that's being lost uh, in the optimal Z vector once you run it through this uh, little autoencoder you obtain it through by minimizing this, this function, okay? Because you can reconstruct Y from Z. So Z has all the information you need. Uh, the second is that Z could be higher dimensional than Y. And uh, the reason this whole thing will work, even if Z is high dimensional, is because of this uh, sparsity uh, penalty, okay? And the sparsity penalty makes, uh, whether you have an encoder or not, the sparsity penalty makes the mapping from Y to optimal Z nonlinear. And that means that, um, 
it's not a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition for an embedding in a high dimensional space to be useful. If you embed a low dimensional object into a high dimensional space through a linear function, it doesn't help you at all. It, it makes, you know, you haven't done anything useful. It has to be a nonlinear mapping for it to be useful because the nonlinear mapping will, uh, you know, make some differences apparent that weren't apparent before. Uh, so it will allow the, you know, the next stage uh, to discriminate between things that uh, weren't discriminable before. So that's a very simple way of you know, associating uh, feature vectors to, to inputs, high dimensional feature vectors in which things are uh, easily uh, um, discriminable. And uh, it's very easy to train, it's very simple. I believe Clément will have uh, some way of taking you through this uh, in a fo follow up session using Torch, if you want to play with that. Okay, I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thank you.